All right, guys, so um, let's resume with uh, the period three overview here. Um, I don't know if I'm posting this out of order, possibly, because I'm recording them out of order. Um, sort of because uh, I, <laughs> I recorded the period two overview and the audio is extremely uh, screwed up. So I may have just wasted 48 minutes of my life. So <laughs> forgive me if I'm a little bitter right now. Uh, but I will go back and I'll, I will get it done or I will fix the audio. We'll see what happens. Um, but period three is, uh, in the AP Euro curriculum is 1815 to 1914. So we're talking about, uh, basically a hundred year period from the end of the Napoleonic Wars until the beginning of World War One. So, um, as part of this video series, the industrial, the first industrial revolution is, is covered in... Um, mar large part in period two because of the timing, even though um, conceptually and unit-wise it's in unit six, which is in this time period. So a couple of uh, broad events that we're going to touch on more specifically. Um, certainly the ideologies of the 19th century, the isms, a bunch of different belief systems um, spanning uh, from liberalism to conservatism and nationalism, feminism, socialism, all sorts of romanticism, all these sorts of uh, challenges to, or uh, attempts to keep in power um, existing governments. Um, really, that is the era developing in the Metternich era, the 1815-1848. Uh, we'll talk about all of that. Uh, unification and centralization of nation states. So uh, clearly the Italian and German unification movements, reforms in Russia, and how France, Britain, and Austria develop you know, on their own. Uh, La Bella Epoque, uh, which is this era from 1860 to 1914, if you see that term, um, that's what it's referring to. The origin of mass politics, first wave feminism, the movement for suffrage, uh, evolution of modern thought, and we'll get into that. Also, new imperialism. So imperialism invasion in Africa and its relationship to industrialization as opposed to the colonial system that had taken place in the colonies beforehand, uh, like the colonies in, for example, the Americas. <clears throat> so, 1815, um, there is the Congress of Vienna, and the Congress of Vienna meets to reestablish order, basically, in Europe after the Napoleonic Wars, in which uh, the French state essentially takes control over a great deal of the territory in um, Europe and really reorganizes a lot of it. So the goals at this Congress, as led by Clemens von Metternich, the Prince of Austria, are conservative. The ideals are, let's reestablish uh, governments, let's kind of turn back the clock on the map, let's establish a stability between states and stability within states. And in, in that effort, this conservative reactionary movement tries to preserve you know, tradition, institutions like the church and the aristocracy, to suppress revolution, right? They basically thought, look at what the French Revolution did, all sorts of chaos, spills over all over Europe, people getting their heads chopped off. This is what liberalism is in their minds, and this is what needs to be restricted. So they will suppress liberal reform. There is kind of an agreement among Austria, Russia, and Prussia to form this holy alliance in which they will essentially agree uh, to concepts like um, reducing revolutionary activity in any of those states, and they will play a role and help one another do that. Um, but the, the main goal also I should mention of the Congress of Vienna, and if we're going to associate it with anything, I should put it on here, is balance of power. The idea that no nation should be able, able to gain as much power as France had in, say, 1807 or so that France was um, unnaturally powerful in Europe and that uh, the maintenance of several basic states uh, was really important. And that's why they don't get rid of France as a result of the Congress of Vienna. They're not like divvying it up among the victors and why the map kind of returns to what it is in, you know, before the Napoleonic Wars in 1792. <clears throat> so all sorts of isms that develop in this period as well. So, essentially, I'll, I'll start actually more on the right. So, liberalism is the Enlightenment ideals of moderate political reform, freer economic markets. This is not 
the universal male suffrage movement. This is the movement for like bourgeois uh, influence in government, capitalism, uh, constitutional government, legal equality among people, although not necessarily suffrage for all men, certainly not for women, religious toleration. And basically the people who are involved in this are educated, wealthy, middle and upper class bourgeoisie. So the petty and the big bourgeoisie, people who are merchants, people who are doctors, lawyers, um, sometimes even teachers, some of these economy, uh, new economic positions in society. Um, while oftentimes in the modern era, our era, we associate nationalism with conservatism in this time, national, nationalism really fits more with liberalism because what it is, is it's a challenge to the conservative model. So nationalism is about creating a, uh, a state based on the will of the people. Um, it's can, the concept is that you have some unifying figures in your nation. What a nation is, is difficult to uh, assign a particular value to. It depends on the state, uh, something that unites groups of people in which they self-identify with. So the idea is self-determination of people's popular sovereignty, that the people of a state, not a monarch of a state, determines what their government ought to be and what their state ought to be. Um, there are some problems with this, obviously, with what do you do in hetero heterogeneous empires where there are um, lots of different states or lots of different nations, like Austria-Hungary, for example, which is why states like Austria-Hungary, or Austria, not yet Austria-Hungary, will have a big problem with this. Um, conservatism is essentially about the status quo, about maintaining the structured um, conservative order with monarchies, either absolute or constitutional, uh, the preservation of stability between and within states. Uh, this is generally, you know, people in power are often conservative, uh, particularly in monarchies, because it's about uh, maintaining status quo, maintaining those ideas. And, and Metternich, the age of Metternich is what we call 1815, 1848. It is a conservative piece in Europe. Uh, there are good things that develop of it. It's a peaceful time. There is some economic recovery. Uh, but ultimately, all of these things start to clash with one another. Important to recognize, and I maybe should have spelled it out at, at first, but toss out necessarily what you think about these words in the modern context, because they don't always mean the same thing. When we talk liberalism, we're talking classical liberalism. When we talk nationalism, we're talking about the formation of a state uh, associated not just with political boundaries, but with national identity boundaries. Um, not necessarily the kind of nationalism or liberalism we see today. So there are a series of revolts that do take place from 1815 to 1848, but in large part, not much happens between 1815 and 1848 in terms of actual, actionable changes to governments. Um, most of them fail. They're liberal and nationalist revolts, and those two things are really tied together. But there are some successes, like the July Monarchy Revolution in 1830 in, um, in, in France, uh, where they call it really the bourgeois monarchy. Uh, it is a liberal identity, uh, a, 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 a monarchy now with some liberal identity and expands the right to vote. Still to like half a million people in a nation of tens of millions is very small. Uh, the Greek independence movement does take place in 1821. Uh, and we do see, you know, the Ottoman Empire nationalism uh, really take its toll on that empire as it is crumbling, always associated with this term, the sick man of Europe, really, from 1571 until its fall in 1918, the Ottoman Empire is in decline. 1848 is the end of this conservative era of basically peaceful time, because in 1848, the line is France sneezed and Europe caught a cold. That as a result of a, a number of factors, but most specifically economic downturn, grain revolts, and food shortages generally associated with, for example, one of the major factors was potato famine in Europe. Uh, most obviously affecting uh, Ireland more than anywhere else, but certainly impacting places like Prussia and other states that are enormously reliant, not necessarily on potatoes as their only crop, but as a significant crop. And so every, all your other resources are strained as a result of that. Um, but the revolutions of 1848 are basically a failure. Um, they represent a high mark for liberal opportunities, but ultimately not a, a great deal of success. There's a famous line that this is a turning point at which history failed to turn, um, that everything seemed like it was about the time and the end of this conservative era, this 33 years of 
uh, really repression of liberal identities and there are lots of opportunities and revolts in, all over the continent, but they're largely unsuccessful. Uh, Great Britain is the only major country to uh, avoid this other than Russia. Um, for the most part, there are significant revolts almost everywhere else in Europe. Britain, basically, because they make moderate reform changes, like expanding the electorate, getting more men the right to vote, not everyone still, but they're making slow, measured changes. This is partly as a result of the fact that Britain has a you know long-term identity as a parliamentary state uh, where order reigns, where there are abilities to make uh, a judgment, uh, progress without a violent revolt. So you can do so within a system that is willing to reform if, um, if not, you know, quite slowly, but it does happen. And so it, it prevents Britain from having a full scale outbreak of revolution. Russia also doesn't have a rebellion at this point for very different reasons. Basically they are a hugely agrarian nation. Uh, 1848, uh, the liberal nationalist revolutions are largely a result of some of the consequences of the externalities involved with the industrial revolution. And that really hasn't hit Russia in any significant way. Um, it's not the only reason for the revolutions in 1848, but it is a, a factor. Russia is kind of disassociated with the rest of Europe uh, politically and culturally, and there really isn't a large intelligentsia able to do much about it. Uh, Russia also has a deeply repressive government and not many cities. You need cities to have revolts, uh, large scale in, in this kind of time period. It's not as if there are no rural revolts, but what are the consequences, really? Um, uh, a couple other isms. Um, I don't know if feminism I put on here or, or is put on here, but feminist movements do arise to some extent. Uh, and there is this first world identity, and it's kind of a, a later uh, element, and we'll, we'll get into that. But romanticism. Romanticism is this basically anti-intellectual movement. They're not saying let's be stupid, but what they're saying is the Enlightenment is has over rationalized everything and that there needs to be more of a turn toward uh you know nature and religion and love and uh you know beauty and the na and the, like the things that are found inside someone not necessarily in their interpretation in their mind um and so the idea is that it's like i think that last line there is appropriate power of nature over man and the disillusionment with progress and reason that there was an, a point at which we were over-intellectualizing everything. We saw the same thing in the Renaissance with the development of the Mannerist school of art after the High Renaissance, which was, hey, we've already basically perfected the form. Let's start to make a statement, do something beyond just be reasonable. Um, this is also certainly influenced by the consequences of the Industrial Revolution and the perceived destruction of nature, and real destruction of nature, I should say. Socialism is worth noting because its origins come up now, but it's not super popular or influential until really the latter part of the 19th century. And then, of course, in 1917, when we see the Russian Revolution. But socialism is really the antithesis of liberalism. The idea is that there should be more government regulation, really almost total government regulation of dealing with uh, problems associated with the Industrial Revolution, like uh, great inequities in social classes. And the ideas were multiple fold, right? We had utopian so socialism, which were people who wanted to create like, um, like communes. Owen, Richard Owen, Louis Blanc, uh, you know, these are early, early ideas um, that community organization was better than having everyone fight for their lives, basically, which is what they how they portrayed liberalism and capitalism. Marxism, as published in the Communist Manifesto in 1848 with, with Engels, is called scientific socialism. And the idea is that Marx thought that he was not really offering a philosophy so much as he thought he was offering an explanation of what was inevitable. He felt that inevitably this downtrodden class of industrial workers would unite. He called them the proletariat, and he said that they would become class conscious, have revolutions, and take over the state and create a communist state. Uh, he thought Britain would be the first one to do this uh, because it was the, most fur the furthest along in the Industrial Revolution. He's clearly not correct that that happens, um, although I mean, I guess maybe it could happen at some point. Um, but 
um, the interpretation is the, uh, his, his writing is the influence for many socialists going forward and is by far more influential than utopian socialism. And it is the background for, say, Lenin and his uh, Bolshevik revolution in Russia in 1917. We have one sort of random event that I think is important to indicate, not so much because you need to know anything about a war being fought, but the Crimean War happens in the middle of the 1850s. And uh, really it is about, uh, Crimea is a little peninsula in the Black Sea, um, and it is the result of a number of different interests in that area between the Ottomans and the Russians and the French and the British, and this idea of like, balance of power politics, like who should be the one in control of this region as the Ottoman Empire kind of falls apart and as Russia tries to impose its will there. Ultimately, um, it is a, the, one of the first industrialized wars uh, where we see the influence of, say, moving troops on, you know, with railroads. Uh, we see some more medical practices you see florence nightingale mentioned there this is the idea of like nursing as a concept women are starting to get more involved as nurses in military uh circumstances i'm not sure what i want to use there um but the crimean war ultimately uh is important because of the results russia sees itself as a, a they're a loser in the war and they're embarrassed in the war and what became very clear as a result of the Crimean War is that Russia was deeply far behind um, the rest of the European states in terms of industrialization. And um, they went back home and they were going to choose to reform, which is something we'll handle in a second. Um, Britain is disillusioned by the war because it is so expensive and the outcome is unclear. Um, it is an era where for the first time you see photographs of the war, they get printed in newspapers, people start to see the war itself, and people are more weary to fight a war when that is the case. Much like in the 1970s, they called Vietnam the, um, the living room war because you saw video of it in your living room. Uh, that making that very real, connecting people to it, makes people more skeptical, maybe, of, of uh, reasons why you fight a war. Uh, because the consequences are so dire. Um, the Ottoman Empire will... Um, it's sort of portrayed in this, uh, in this bullet point as a good thing, but it, it, Ottoman Empire is uh, really forced to liberalize their economy, recognize some secular uh, identities, and develop some... Uh, more liberal ideals. Um, basically, in 1876, they issue even these things called the Tanzimat reforms and a constitution. Um, ultimately, it is unable to fend off the decline of the Ottoman Empire. There's a revolution in 1908 by people called the Young Turks. And ultimately, the idea is that technically the Ottoman Empire still exists by the time World War I comes around, but realistically, they had fallen by that by then. Um, and it's going to disintegrate at the end of World War I. So as a result of the Crimean War, Russia, I mentioned, is going to make some changes because they realize, well, Alexander II realizes, well, we are way behind. So what does he need to do? So, you know, they're going to try and modernize, but how do they modernize? How does the Russian state, which is so different from the rest of the states of Europe, how do they industrialize? Well, Firstly, you cannot have an industrial revolution unless you have a working class that can work in the industrial revolution. And serfdom made that impossible. It meant that people were tied to the land, they could not move to cities, they were stuck in this old agrarian system. And so in 1861, he abolishes serfdom. Now, um, sounds like a good thing, and it is, but ultimately the impact is more minor than you might expect. Those people are still... Uh, instead of paying taxes directly to their nobles, now they are, or excuse me, to the state, they are now required to, like, compensate their own boyars uh, for their freedom, which is um, not necessarily a particularly different situation, much like, say, you know, the emancipation of slaves after, after the Civil War in the United States still resulted in weird, you know, terrible economic conditions like sharecropping in which the conditions were not you know, fundamentally different, although legally they were not owned. So there is certainly a difference, and it is better that Serfdom demanded, of course. There were all sorts of other reforms as well, um, but overall the message is this. Um, Russia does take some steps for reform, but they don't 
remotely catch up to the rest of Europe. In fact, they continue to fall further and further behind because while they are, in, you know, Germany and Britain and France are engaging in the second industrial revolution, Russia is very slowly trying to modernize. Um, Alexander III pops up again, um, you know, then followed by Nicholas II. We still have autoc autocratic and repressive governments. Um, and that is really the, the message still in Russia, that just because there are some modernization reforms, we should not view them as liberalized reforms. They certainly are not. Uh, we have a very top-down governmental structure um, that will last until, well, I guess the Soviet Union is also that way, uh, but in a very different way. Okay. One of the other developments is the unification of some of the last nation states in Europe, so Italy and Germany. So Italy, um, basically as inspired by a number of people and another idea, a bunch of ideas, un starts to unite after the revolutions of 1848. The idea for the you know, Italian unification is often termed as risorgimento. So you should have a, a good handle on what that means. Um, you know, those people are all mentioned here. Cavour is this prime minister who helps Victor Emmanuel II, the leader of Piedmont Sardinia, the, the king. Um, which basically unites the Italian peninsula through a series of wars and diplomacy. Mazzini is this inspirational nationalist romantic poet who speaks about Italian nationalism. Giuseppe Garibaldi, uh, leader of the Red Shirts, someone who fights for it, basically lands in, the, in Sicily and takes over a large area. But the Italian unification movement is, is a new one, right? For the whole time we've talked about it, since, since Rome, the, you know, the Roman Empire existed, there has been no real unification on the Italian peninsula. And there is a complication between, like, to what extent is Italianness even a real thing? Because um, most people are not speaking what today we'd call Italian. That's Florentine Italian. Um, there are vast differences in wealth and interest from the north to the south. Uh, but the, the movement starts really in earnest in 1861 and will be done uh, mostly by 1866 and then by 1871 or 1870. Uh, the Papal States will be unified as well. Germany, uh, German unification is the most, as significant, in, uh, has a, as significant an effect on Europe as, as almost anything we've talked about. Um, German, German particularism was this old idea that had been in place for hundreds and hundreds of years that um, the German states had a loose organization, whether that organization be, <clears throat> for most times, the Holy Roman Empire, um, but again, very loose or the German Confederation, but um, ultimately not a unified state. By 1871, after a series of wars um, through blood and iron war, Otto von Bismarck, one of the most important men of the 19th century, unites a German state through war um, and through, with, by, through basically adding states to Prussia. Um, it wasn't immediately clear that Prussia would be the entity to unite Germany or that that would happen, but they fight a small Danish war to take control of Schleswig-Holstein up here, um, and then they fight Austria-Hungary and basically make it, uh, or they fight Austria, um, Hungary, and uh, put them in a position where they're not going to be able to be a, a challenge to that. Then they fight France, take control here, and unite all of the German-speaking uh, areas really of Europe and so it is the unification based on linguistic and ethnic background <clears throat> but not religious um, there is uh, as a result of things like the Peace of Augsburg and the Peace of Westphalia um, we have large areas that are Catholic large areas that are Protestant <clears throat> Bismarck employs this idea and this term is important to know called real politic and the idea is he is not about ideology or philosophy, although I would definitely argue he is generally conservative. Uh, there are some certain things he does that do not fit that model. He is practical, and he is basically a nationalist focus on the idea that the German state is the most important thing to, do, to focus on, to cr the creation of a German uh, state uh, that had not really ever existed before. This upsets the balance of power in Europe as it had been set for a long time, especially as Germany becomes a very important leading factor in the second industrial revolution. And in the lead up now to World War I, it will be the Anglo-German rivalry that will be the most significant uh, in driving a 
very, very dangerous and militaristic kind of culture throughout Europe on, on the eve of the First World War. Bismarck is a conservative, but it's complicated. So, you know, he believes in a strong military state, right? Prussia always has had that identity. I mentioned this before, you know, they, the saying is it's not a, it's not a, um, it's not a state with an army. It's an army with a state. Um, he is not interested in liberalizing reforms. They have a uh, diet, but it does not have real control. Um, what does he do? Well, he tries to downplay any other sources of power. One of those would be the Catholic Church. And he does that by ending some of the religious privileges that churches had in Germany. Uh, he calls that Kulturkampf, a clash of cultures. He will also ban the liberal party, the SDP. But in addition, he will then enact some of their social welfare programs. So while we will associate Bismarck as a uh, militaristic conservative, he is also really the first guy to impose a you know, limited but a welfare state in Germany with state-sponsored medical insurance and accident insurance in a way that is really very modern. I mean, we're living in a country right now in which that's not the case. Um, so super, super modern. And so it really makes calling him just a conservative very limited. He is very much a pragmatist. Okay. Other states in the period. So France um, was a liberal empire under Napoleon III. So after the revolutions of 1848, Napoleon III is elected uh, president of the second French, or uh, of the, <coughs> excuse me, the second French Republic. And then in 1851, I believe, uh, has a coup and basically names himself the emperor. He becomes Louis Napoleon. Louis Napoleon becomes Napoleon III. And he is a liberal um, emperor, though. So he in, invests in, um, you know, liberalization reforms in terms of economics. He will redesign the cities like Paris, like under a man named Hausmann, for all sorts of reasons, like moving around troops and dealing with problems of the Industrial Revolution. But he is engaging in domestic reforms. There are some um, real economic problems, like the Credit Mobilier scandal. But ultimately, it's a pretty successful reign in that, you know, it, it, it kind of instills a German, na uh, it, excuse me, French nationalism through education, through a number of other factors, but railroads as well, the building of a infrastructure as a state. Ultimately, in about 1870, 1871, um, there is a, a bunch of revolts, largely during the Franco-Prussian War, when he is in a, Napoleon III is in a very uh, tenuous situation. And so ultimately... Napoleon III is overthrown, and there is now a third French Republic. I think we're now on the fifth one, so pretty much every 20 years, someone gets overthrown in France. Um, Austria has to form a dual monarchy. So Austria, as a sign that they are kind of <coughs> lessening in their ability to defeat um, internal enemies, let alone external ones, um, they uh, grant Hungary essentially co-monarchy status. So now they will go from being the Austrian Empire to the Austro-Hungarian Empire um, in this Ostkrieg, the Compromise of 1867. And Austria is, a reminder, um, really dealing with a great deal of nationalism because there are huge numbers of Austrians, Hungarians, Slovaks, Slovenes, uh, Croats, uh, Bohemians, slash Czech, uh, and, and Romanians, and lots of other... Uh, groups and they are not unified in the same nationalistic sense as say France or Britain so nationalism might serve French interests might serve British interests might serve German interests but in Austria it serves to break up the state and Austria is a state in decline and one that will end again at the end of World War One. Britain is able to maintain a stable um, and progressive uh, economic growth status in the 19th century because they don't have these huge revolutions and they do have a parliament that's willing and able to make choices that benefit the state economically and ultimately uh, more people are involved in government. Uh, surely it is a slow process, but mass political parties develop, Tories and Whigs. I mean, there's an origin for that even in the latter part of the 17th century, but the electorate um, continues to be grow grown. 
I don't think you need to know the difference between um, Gladstone and Benjamin Disraeli, but uh, two major prime ministers who had a huge political tiff. But they represent the existence of a very healthy political uh, party system in Britain in the latter part of the 19th century. Britain will also expand their colonies, will reference imperialism in a little bit, um, and start to invest in some of the more modern ideas of the 19th century. So in the wake of the, you know, a later industrialized state, Britain starts to do things like deal with public health and housing. So, you know, uh, investing in sanitation efforts and uh, public housing to alleviate uh, problems with the poor in the latter part of the 19th century. Britain is a great example of a state willing to, while still being capitalist, willing to kind of make choices to help uh, really the lowest in their society and also uh, intervene in economic matter matters uh, when necessary, in a very modern way, like uh, a modern economy, a modern centralized bank would do. From 1860 to 1914, uh, there is a sweeping number of changes in Europe. Um, industrialization really hits all of Europe, with the exception, really, of Russia and the Iberian Peninsula, for the most part. Um, industrialization becomes the, the norm now in Europe. Um, as a result of a number of factors, and we'll talk about imperialism here, um, there is these, these sort of developments that I've referenced already, the rise of mass political parties, but again, women are largely left out of that still. Um, it won't be until after World War I that women will generally gain the right to vote, uh, although there will be a women's suffrage movement that is the first, wo uh, first wave feminism in this time. Um, but La Belle Epoque, La Belle Epoque also comes with um, an idea like, is this kind of progress a good thing, a beautiful thing, right? Uh, it's sort of sarcastic, the, the term. Like, um, there comes with it this identity of, like, what is the uh, rational thought? Uh, are we relying too much on rationalism? And uh, some of these changes, like Freud and cubism or um, positivism kind of... Uh, spell out a an era in existentialism even as it comes shortly after this era in which like science and and philosophical thought both kind of reach the conclusion that maybe the world isn't that static maybe um we don't understand everything maybe uh our ideas of norms you know with coming up with quantum mechanics and these sorts of things all of them together is this really the world that we expected it to be before? So uh, here's a chart that just kind of compares the first and second industrial revolutions, which um, I talked about the first industrial revolution in the other video, either <laughs> that I will fix or that I will redo. And the second industrial revolution really takes place everywhere, but uh, Germany is the leading state here. It's catching up to Britain enormously. The second industrial revolution is largely a chemical revolution. It's about the creation of things like uh, you know, electricity and oil, and if that sounds like the kind of thing that runs the, the, the world today, you're right. I mean, oil and electricity are still the large power sources of the modern era, so we are still really living in, in a second industrial revolution. Uh, the inventions are hugely influential and continue to play a huge role. Automobiles and railroads and the telegraph and the phone, radio, these are all second industrial revolutions and really formulate the modern era. It is the, like... Um, sophistication of the Industrial Revolution, really. And it's a, its ability to kind of adjust the standard of living as well. So making choices with sewers um, and some other public health measures, a recognition that, like, miasma theory, that bad air causes disease doesn't work, but, like, people like Edwin Chadwick saying, cholera is here, I can prove it, and a government willing to make some choices um, to, to mitigate those effects. So in the 19th century, politics, um, political structures start to respond to these types of things. Like I said, water and sewage systems are created to deal with cholera epidemics, particularly in Great Britain. Um, there is uh, redistricting and a dealing with housing because of all the new people who are living in, in cities. You know, London and Paris and these major cities explode in population, and there has to be a way to deal with that. Uh, and state governments, city government, I mean, um, 
country, na national governments and city governments start to do things to, to mitigate the effects of that. Uh, it also comes with um, things, unfortunate things like anti-Semitism that results after, you know, large scale movement of uh, Jews and other groups, Roma people, so on and so forth, from other parts of Europe into the industrialized cities. That with that comes this kind of cultural conflict. Um, like I mentioned, the rise of mass political parties is there, uh, comes along with mass communication, right? Telegraph, uh, phone, railroads, newspapers, all of this is creating a mass identity for a state, mass media, all of these come together. More men get to vote, there's a rise in leftist parties, and labor unions start to be a, a major factor as industrialized work becomes more and more prevalent. As far as women, um, they have some access to some work, um, generally called like pink collar jobs, a term that is generally a little passe today, uh, but like teaching and nursing and a few other professions. But this is again for middle class women for the most part. There are unmarried women generally who are working in factories, that does happen. But in large part, we're not seeing a huge uh, change in the status of women, right? They're still working in a cult of domesticity where women are generally expected to raise a family. Although in the urban world where more people need to work, that is kind of challenged uh, rather than this old agrarian ideal of, of a man and woman and uh, farm and the, the family structure. I also mentioned already the rise in the latter part of the 19th century for first wave feminism, which is the women's suffrage movement. Um, it will ultimately be successful largely as a result of World War I. Um, I reference kind of modern thought as an important development as well. And to expand on it a bit, um, from a scientific perspective, we're talking about um, a, a shift from the Enlightenment idea that Newton's mechanistic view of the world as like, you do this, this happens, this deterministic idea moves towards uncertainty in an era in which we are increasingly understanding relativity and quantum energy and these things that are really difficult to fit with our classical understanding of the world. Um, Comte advocates for a thing called positivism, which is essentially that human development has culminated in the development of science and that it is a very rational take on the world. But most of the modern thought is very uncertain. And I think this really is how we look at uh, progress today in that, yeah, we know certain facts and certain things to be true, but we also know uh, how in unstable a lot of those ideals are and how change ever changing they are. We also see the development of the theory of um, natural selection and evolution, uh, hugely influential, unfortunately also influential in a very bad way. The development of social Darwinism is used to justify um, basically your white Europeans and their conquest of non-white Africans and Asians in this time and uh, serves as a justification for what they do. And I'll, I'll reference that when I talk about new imperialism as well. Um, in philosophy, we also see a change here. So Nietzsche's idea of an ubermensch, the idea that is um, uh, really subverted by Hitler and used to his ends, but not what, Hitler, not what Nietzsche had in mind. Um, Freud is advocating for looking at things in a more philosophical sense. It's kind of skewing the, it's kind of like blurring the line between science and philosophy, the social sciences. Now Freud is wrong about almost everything, uh, but he's not wrong that psychology is an important and real thing to discuss and that it is a social science and that it's difficult to put it somewhere between the hard sciences and the um, interpretive sciences of the modern era. Um, I reference new imperialism a few times here. So new imperialism is a term used to kind of apply to the idea that in the 19th and 20th centuries, really starting in earnest in the second industri uh, industrial revolution, 1870 to about World War I, where European states scramble for Africa and then also scramble to take control of states in Asia, although generally less directly. So um, we see... Um, some Protestant missionaries, but generally the Catholic countries are not the ones that are involved in this, so we don't see the same thing. This chart really kind of compares mo early modern colonization from the in the Americas to modern new imperialism. Now, I've already gone over the first one, so I won't do that again. Um, but it is also about the imperialism of free trade, the idea of apply, excuse me, applying capitalistic and industrial principles to imperialism. 
So the motives are that colonies are characteristic of your power, that you are able to use them for any number of factors. But in industry definitely draw uh, focuses on this, right? So it has greater access to raw materials, uh, greater access to new markets and labor, and also um, it is a way to sort of uh, measure yourself against other states. Um, if you ever hear a term, the Eastern question, by the way, in this era of imperialism, it means like the concern that the Ottoman Empire is falling apart and what are we going to do with all these areas that they control? Also sort of a new imperialistic idea um, and something that will come up after World War I. Um, basically, it's possible because of the Industrial Revolution, right, that if European states could have, in the 16th and 17th centuries, they would have colonized Africa and Asia. Why don't they? Well, they don't have the massive scale technological advantage that allows it to be possible. They can't communicate with their people. They can't use, walk into, you know, Shaka Zulu's uh, home and fire a machine gun, right? That, that was not possible. They did not have those advantages. Um, and it was only possible really the Americas because of the large scale death by disease that takes place that would not happen in Africa or Asia because they're also been exposed to diseases like smallpox and so and others. They were also very limited in their ability to colonize in these areas because of um, the issues of um, climate. Uh, for example, white Europeans generally can't deal with the malaria and some of the other, you know, tsetse flies and all these other problems of Africa and, and the, the equatorial world. And so they have problems imposing their will there. But with the advantages of medicine like quinine, which fights against malaria or uh, other developments like the, you know, uh, ability to develop a steamboat to get places quick more quickly this becomes more and more possible. The railroad also makes it possible to like, not just colonize the, the coast, but actually go internally. It gives you access to a lot more raw materials, a lot more people. Their justifications are essentially that this is a natural course of action under free trade, that this is about civilizing, quote unquote, um, basically Christianizing as well. Uh, and social Darwinism, which I referenced earlier, is also used as a a justification for this. And social Darwinism is the inaccurate uh, use of Darwinism to apply to people and to suggest that, um, not that humans didn't evolve, but the idea meaning that the way that social Darwinists uh, display it is that, well, if white people control the world, that's because they're better or smarter or more capable. And so it's used as a justification for why they're able to engage in what is a absolutely horrific exploitation of Sub-Saharan Africans and Asians in the period of 1870 to 1914. Um, one of the worst is the Congo, led by Belgium, uh, and then ultimately by Leo Leopold II himself. But the largest colonizers at this point would be Britain and France, uh, carrying uh, uh, the load of the colonies and really having control over most of Africa in a very short period of time. In Asia... Britain has one of their, the crown jewel really of their colonial system is India. You know, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people, um, huge labor force, produces most of the world's textiles up until about the 16th, uh, 17th century. Um, and there are all sorts of problems with that, but uh, it won't be until 1947 that Britain will give that up or really any of their um, imperial holdings in Africa for the most part. In China, uh, they don't really control it as a colony at any point in time, but basically through a number of factors, they're able to impose their economic will on China and basically require them to trade with them, even though China really was not interested. Um, they fight these things called the Opium Wars, where essentially uh, Britain fought a war with China because China made it illegal for Britain to sell the Chinese citizens opium. And so Britain fought a war so that they could continue to sell opium. Um, and they destroy China because China has not industrialized. Um, a state that was previously untouchable to the Europeans. I mean, for most of human history, China is way more technologically uh, uh, capable and has way, way, way more people and more resources. But the industrialized world just changes the game, right? I mean, when people with guns come up against people without guns, you know, the, 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 it's very difficult uh, to see any other option uh, than the people in an industrial world world taking over. Um, Russia tries to get involved with this as well. 
although uh, they will largely be ineffective and, in fact, in 1905 will lose a war to Japan in what is a stunning event for the Russian state and helps to be part of the process of the discontent leading to the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. There was also a minor revolution in 1905. Um, uh, but basically, it's uh, they also are deeply concerned that they could lose to non-white people. Um, so, again, social Darwinism at play here. The same kind of racialized identities. Uh, they use these things called like phrenology, like the study of the human skull. It's all pseudoscience. Uh, there are other worse words for it today, but pseudoscience would be the nice way to put it. Uh, and then it's completely made up nonsense. Uh, France, like I mentioned, also takes control of uh, Indonesia. Well, the, the Netherlands also has control of a lot of Indonesia. I should probably put that there. France really has control of Indochina and a lot of Africa. Africa. So Africa is partitioned. Uh, mostly at the Berlin Conference from 1884 to 1885, where there you see in that political cartoon, basically a bunch of European states led, you know, in front of Otto von Bismarck there, um, the old uh, diplomat in Germany, and they basically cut up Africa however they want. Uh, whoever can impose their will in a certain area, obviously African states are not inv invited to this. And in a very short period of time, Africa goes from being basically independent to being almost entirely colonized except for like Ethiopia and Liberia in like a 25 year period. It's really remarkable. Um, as a result of this, we see increased economic and political competition for these states. Imperialism will be a driving force in World War I and something we will talk about at that point. Um, it is basically an economic extraction model. They're going in to take things out. Uh, they are not setting up generally settler colonies in which lots of white people migrate to, like happen in the United States or in Australia or in New Zealand or in Canada. That doesn't really happen. For mostly, um, I, I think largely for uh, reasons of climate, uh, but there are other reasons as well. But it is extreme, basically an extremely exploitative uh, situation. You know, millions of Congolese people getting their hands chopped off. Um, and, you know, the, the effects of uh imperialism in this era still are present even in an independent africa um and we see this really here so in europe it leads to an enormous economic boom right lots of raw materials uh lots of ways to build up the economy it fuels the industrial revolution which fuels a need for more raw materials which really emphasizes the importance of imperialism again. And so it is a positive feedback loop that we have to see new imperialism and industrialization fueling one another. Uh, that a buildup of one creates or necessitates a buildup of the other. Um, there is also um, uh, increase in conflict and tension between European states because of all of these other issues now. Not just you know, borders in Europe, but also borders in Africa and borders in Asia and rights to certain economic like opportunities. And so again, one of the factors leading into World War One. On the world, um, you know, it has a, a really interesting effect, right? Exploitation of the peoples involved. Um, it leads to an increased interconnected world, the more globalized world that we're far from what we would call globalization, but definitely the world is more connected. The development of things like the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal means goods are moving more quickly. People are moving more quickly between states. We see in this time period significant global migrations. One of the trends is people in colonies, wealthy people in colonies, moving to metropoles in uh, Europe and getting involved. Um, you know, it leads to a little bit of more migration in Europe. We have like populations that are not all English or all French. England's going to see a number of Indians and and, and, and people move to that country. Um, you know, it has impact on, like it says here, cultural diversity to some extent. Um, you know, like chicken tiki masala, it's the official dish of Scotland, right? Seems ridiculous, but it's because of the, uh, it's, I think it's created in Scotland. It's part of the same kind of example. Now that's an absurd example and you don't need to know it, but I think it's important. So ultimately, all of these things, and when we're looking at 1815 to 1914, it's important to recognize all of this really as a lead up to World War I. Because the, the, it is a deeply complex, um, you know, panoply of reasons why World War I becomes what it is. And how it is this truly transformative event in a way that I'm not sure another event really was. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that in the next period of time. But I'll see you for period four and uh, take it easy.